Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Welcome everybody, thank you for joining us. My name is Joanne Cannon and I'm the Executive Editor for Healthcare at Politico and I'm moderating today's discussion. We have four panelists today and starting on my immediate right, Bob Blendon, Professor of Health Policy and Political Analysis at the Harvard H. T. H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School and my friend and mentor. He's taught me a lot of what I know about what we're going to talk about today. Doug Elmendorf is a Dean and Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And joining us remotely are Kate Baker, Dean of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, and Stuart Altman, Professor of National Health Policy at the Heller School for Social Policy and Man Management at Brandeis University. The event is being presented jointly today with Politico. We're streaming lives on the website of the forum and Politico, and also on Facebook and YouTube. You can find us everywhere. Uh, we will include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to the forum, one word, the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And you can participate in the live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. So we're going to talk about health care costs. We spend more in the United States per capita than any other developed country, and probably more than any other undeveloped country. Um, <laughs> that much we know. You're safe. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's not so clear, or maybe it is clear. We're not necessarily getting our money's worth. We do not have the best health care in the world consistently across the board. We do great things, but we also do some things that aren't so great. So what do we do about it? This is a problem that's not a new problem. We have solutions. We're not very good at agreeing on how to go forward with them, which is what we'll be talking about today. Democrats and Republicans in Washington have very different plans for dealing with health care spending. But mostly, they're shifting costs around rather than really getting at the fundamental root problem of how much we as a nation, individuals and government, are spending on health care. It's cost shifting. It's not cost reduction, other than some shifting it around, mar around the margins. Um, and there's also a disconnect between how the public sees health care, how we think about our out-of-pocket spending. Policymakers think about the GDP and how much the nation is spending. And how do we know this? Well, they've been researching it for years, but Bob and I can also tell you that we've been doing polls for, I think, three years now. And the last two have really looked the, uh, a lot at public attitude toward health care. We have one that's up on the website that came out just a few weeks ago. And that's, in part, a, dis a background for today's discussion. Um, but we're also going to talk about solutions, what some of our pal pa panelists think could address both the out-of-pocket burden that we as consumers slash patients feel. I remember when they were called patients. Um, and as well as the total cost of national expenditures, which is no matter what your political priorities are, healthcare is squeezing out something that you care about. Um, so one result of our poll was that Americans blame high prices by drug companies. That's been a finding for about three years now. Um, and not just our poll, other polls have found out the American public is really mad at the drug companies. But it is actually broader than that. It's not just the drug companies. It's not just drug prices. Um, and our poll found out that the American public is mad at just about everybody except themselves. <laughs> so let's set the stage by taking a look um, at a video from Families USA about how drug costs are affecting one woman and her hope that Congress will help. Hi, my name is Catherine, and I'm from Wheeling, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. I am on a fixed income due to multiple medical conditions, including a life-saving lung transplant, and I am on Social Security disability. My annual income is $22,000 a year, and my outlay for medication is $11,000 per year. 
which is obviously 50% of my total income. One of my biggest struggles is my prescription drug deductible, which I meet in January of every year. This causes a significant financial burden. The next thing is when I hit the donut hole. When this happens, my co-pays go up and that directly impacts my monthly cash outlays. I am hoping that Congress will vote on a plan that reduces drug prices because if this doesn't change, I'm headed for financial bankruptcy and possible homelessness and right now I don't see any way out. Thank you. So Bob, tell us about our poll. Uh, so uh, first, the important thing is th this session occurs before something moves to the top of the national agenda. So what we see on polling is that for the last few years, drug prices was the only cost issue in anybody's mind. In the recent polling, when you give people lists for priorities, you suddenly discover overall costs are below drug costs, but they're moving up. So somewhere over the next three or four years, dealing with something that the panelists have dealt with their whole careers is going to be back uh, on, on the agenda. Uh, so there are uh, just a couple points and then we can look at this very, very, very uh, uh, briefly. Uh, in as other past debates, we've suffered from this problem that the best views of experts and average people driving the issue are not always the same. And that, that just is a problem. So what you'll see in a, in a moment, we gave people uh, 17 reasons that costs could be high in the United States, every one that any expert has ever come up with. And uh, you'll see in a moment of the 17, the answer was simple, price, 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 price. And it's everybody's prices. Uh, is they didn't stop at pharmaceuticals. The hospitals like to say I'm innocent, but it turned out not to be true. Uh, for that, uh, what they didn't see as guilty, and we'll look at this very quickly, is uh, either their own overuse of care with their physicians, absolutely I'm innocent, and two, uh, uh, we're getting older, they don't buy that argument. We're getting sicker, they don't buy that argument. It's really prices, so why don't we just look at the first slide. So this is of 17. Uh, uh, so the public was afraid that uh, uh, Doug would feel forgotten, so they listed the government, federal government, <laughs> contributing this as well. Uh, they didn't want him to think that he was off the hook uh, from his earlier life. Uh, so you could see this, it's prices, prices, prices uh, for it. Uh, and so uh, then you just uh, uh, switch. We made it simple to make the second point, if you show the slides. Uh, so is it prices or is it we're using too much health care? And they just wanted you to know, no, uh, <laughs> for that. It's, it's not I'm getting too many surgeries, too many tests. It's, it's the price charge uh, issue. So we're having one level of discussion here, but the others. Uh, so then we gave them uh, a seven uh, choices that the policy community has been talking about for a large number of years. Uh, 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 next slide. We asked uh, 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 two questions that will turn out later. Uh, do you think that these things would uh, 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 work? And luckily for school public health, actually believe if you invest in preventing future diseases, it actually has a payoff uh, for that. So, uh, but in the middle of great debates nationally between competition and regulation, the public thinks both sound great. They have no particular uh, 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 view. Uh, buying into Medicare sounds good, and about half think Medicare for all might reduce costs. And then we did something that was quite unusual. We actually asked if you thought it would save a lot of money. And there is incredible cynicism across the country. That is, people don't believe anything, including living healthier lives, is going to save a lot of money. It'll save a little bit of money. So uh, what you have is these are, 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 are the priorities. And the majority of people do not believe whatever your support for Medicare for all opposition, that it's going to save a lot of money uh, uh, for that. And so before, before we go, and the colleagues will, will talk about this, where you see the biggest philosophical, ideological party divide is, is the next slide. And so at the end of the day, who would do a better job controlling health care costs? 
uh, private insurance companies to the government. And I don't think you need a computer to figure out that Democrats say government, uh, if you want to watch the primaries, and Republicans say, let's stick with private health insurance industry. So that's, as this issue's emerging, that's sort of the public background. Surely has no answers, uh, but it shows there is going to be a very big focus on, does the price of a, of a hospital stay go down, and the drug go down, and my doctor's fees, uh, and less of a focus in this public world about is spending going from 3.2% to 2.8%. Uh, that's what you get from interviewing across the country. Okay, so we know what the public thinks, which is that it's all prices. Doug, how did we get to where we are today, spending 17, between 17 and 18% of GDP is healthcare? Well, I think people are right to be unhappy about how much they spend on healthcare personally and if they understood how much the country spends on health care, they'd be right to be unhappy about that. And as you said, Joanne, it's not just a matter of how much we spend, but how little health we get for it. We are less healthy as a population, the population of many countries around the world that spend much less than we do. And this has arisen through a combination of uh, increases in prices and increases in the quantities of health care services that we consume. It's not so much days in the hospital or a number of visits to the doctors as the intensity of the treatment that we get when, when we go there. Uh, changing this trajectory in a significant way is a very big challenge, um, or we would have done these changes already. Uh, but I want to highlight two particular obstacles that I see. Uh, one is that we have basically wasted almost a decade of health policy uh, tension and energy uh, through Republicans confused attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act. I use the word confused carefully here. I was director of the Congressional Budget Office during the passage of the Affordable Care Act. In 2009 and 10, there was a serious debate about what health policy the country should take going forward. But since 2010, the Republicans have focused on the proposition that there is some alternative to the Affordable Care Act that would maintain high levels of insurance coverage, uh, but at much lower government cost and personal cost and fewer government regulations. And that's a core proposition that is false. Neither logic nor evidence support that proposition. But that has been the core proposition of Republicans' attempts to legislate uh, and campaign and uh, give speeches. So we've just spent a decade uh, chasing a, a mirage <laughs> that can't be there. And we should have spent that decade working on the things that we're going to talk more about today. Uh, the second obstacle I would highlight is that in general in this country, uh, the way that we uh, control spending on some good or service, the way we get value for our money in some area, is that we use competition and market forces. And I am a, a long time and current believer that we should strengthen uh, competition in US healthcare, strengthen the role of market forces, but uh, I do not think that will be enough. Um, that's true for some old reasons and some new reasons. The old reasons are that healthcare is not a service like any other kind of service. Um, consumers, patients, don't know what they're getting. It's very hard to make those choices. Um, they're going to have insurance against expensive care. Um, uh, information is not so available. So there's a set of reasons why it was always going to be hard to strengthen competition in healthcare and the way we do many other aspects of our economy. But there are also some new reasons. Uh, one is that just the um, one way one could strengthen competition is in Medicare. And Republicans' attacks on these insurance exchanges for people under 65 has hardly paved the way for creating a similar sort of competitive exchange environment for people over age 65. This was the premium support model. Um, but also what we've seen in the last uh, decade in particular is greater concentration, mergers, uh, acquisitions uh, among providers of healthcare and among ins health insurers. So the conditions for competition, a lot of competing providers and competing insurance insurers, uh, those conditions aren't really there anymore. So what was always an uphill road to make competition strong enough to really s constrain healthcare spending is now a much steeper road. And I think that means we need to devote more attention to less market oriented. I would do those market things anyway, but devote more attention to less market oriented, more uh, regulatory approaches. Okay. Kate, you have studied our health, where our health care dollars are going. Do you think we're getting good value for what we're spending? 
I agree with you that there is ample evidence that we should be getting a lot more health for all the money that we're spending. And of course, spending is price times quantity. And I agree with Doug and the general public that there's lots of evidence that market forces are far from sufficient to drive us towards high value use of our healthcare resources. But I wanna be sure we don't ignore quantities. We are surely spending too much on some areas of healthcare and too little on others. And getting the prices right is not just about paying less, but about aligning incentives for physicians and hospitals and manufacturers and patients to allocate healthcare dollars where they're actually improving health as much as they could. I would love to see market forces alone work. I agree that's not likely to happen, particularly in markets where there's a lot of consolidation of insurers or a lot of consolidation of providers or no competition for sole source drugs. So introducing competition is surely a force for good in driving us towards higher value, unlikely to be sufficient. And I'd want to think really carefully about how any interventions in regulating prices would affect not only the quantity of healthcare that we use to drive us towards higher value uses, reduce the use of stuff that's not improving health, maybe increase the use of some underutilized preventive care or highly effective primary care, and also the effect on innovation in the long term. What are the treatments and strategies and medicines available in the future? Okay, Stuart, you also have been studying this for many years, um, maybe more than Anyone else here? Um, All right. So, <laughs> what's driving? What's driving it? Permit me to sort of take a little different tack. I don't uh, argue against the idea that we're not getting enough in quality. I don't think that's the that's really where you're going to get at this issue. When all gets said and done, what you're dealing with is not cost, but it's spending. And if you look and compare the United States to other countries, what really separates us from these other countries is that they function under some form of a budget and they force their healthcare system to live within a constrained set of revenues. This idea of worrying about prices in and of itself isn't the issue. Yes, it ultimately comes down to that, but if you don't figure out a way to sort of slow the growth in spending, you will never get at the right thing. This issue, and the second issue, sure, you can argue that we should be getting more value. But I don't think other countries get that much more value in their healthcare system than we do. What they do do, which is we're finding more and more, is the idea that there's a lot of non-healthcare services that affect our health in a positive way. We call them social determinants. There's no question we need to be spending more there. But let me emphasize this. We have to figure out a way to slow the growth in spending. And the only way to do that is to slow the growth in revenue. And you can either do that through some form of government constraint on the flow of dollars, or something like we're trying in Massachusetts by putting the system under a benchmark and forcing all the components of the system to try to live within a constrained environment. And you know what? It's working. It's not working fantastically, but Massachusetts over the past eight years has managed to slow its growth rate. Being, it used to be the most expensive state in the world, which is the most expensive state in the U.S. We've now turned that over to Alaska. We're now number two. Not only that, our, <laughs> not only that, our growth rate is, is the fourth lowest in the country. So I'll stop here. But if we don't focus on the revenue, you will never be able to seriously deal the prices or the cost. And yes, we should do it in a way that improves quality and gets more value. We need to get back revenues. Okay, now you know why we invited Stuart to be part of this, because he's the only person who could get Massachusetts and Alaska and healthcare costs in one <laughs> sentence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we now have laid out the issues. We're gonna go into this a little bit more deeply. Um, before we do that, we are gonna talk about what we can do about these problems a little bit more. But first, we're going to watch a clip about Medicare, which is really a big part of the discussion. Medicare for All is a new and bigger part of the discussion. Um, this particular clip we're about to see features a self-employed woman named Sue Lancelota, and it comes courtesy of HHS. Since I was 14, I've been working and, and drawing a paycheck and contributing. 
I was self-employed. Uh, I had to pay for any insurance that was very, very expensive. And now I've been uh, on Medicare for six years and it just adds uh, a lot of peace of mind. When my mom got covered, I felt like it would take a big burden off of her financially. Twelve weeks ago, I ruptured a tendon in my foot and found out that I needed surgery. Medicare has given me the opportunity to get everything I need to make a full recovery. I am extremely excited about her getting healthy again without having to take on additional financial burdens. I do want to come back and talk about Medicare for All, but I think I want to talk about the ACA first because the national conversation, which had been going very much in a Medicare for All direction, that's what we thought we were going to spend the next two years writing about, lo and behold, we're back to repealing and replacing Obamacare. Um, and. Um, that is what's on the table in the short run. I mean, we will come back to Medicare for All, but Medicare for All is not going to pass in the next two years, right? I mean, even if it, forget about 20, post-2020, we don't know what the world will look like. Medicare for All probably won't even come up for a vote this year. If it were to pass the House, which is not all that likely, um, it would no way would get past the Senate, which is in Republican hands. So before we come back to that, um, the ACA is, is back, you know, I didn't get a lot of sleep in the last two weeks. Um, can we fix it? Is that really our starting point? I mean, what would you, what would you, you know, you, you helped, you helped keep it on the straight and narrow fiscally, Doug, the, in the early days. What do we do now? Well, I think, um, I keep thinking that we've seen the last spasm of anti-ACA fervor. Yeah, so do and I. And that we will soon <laughs> move to a focus on ways that one can legitimately improve and refine any program we have in place. I think maybe we have. I mean, you've seen the reaction uh, to President Trump's proposal, or non-proposal, but intention, and everybody ran from that. Uh, and today in the New York Times, there was a very interesting uh, column by two leading conservative health policy analysts laying out what they viewed as an agenda for Republican policymakers. And the items fell into basically two categories. One was putting back into the Affordable Care Act, into law, aspects of the Affordable Care Act that had been pushed out by Republican pressure over the last nine years. And the other was additional government engagement in the health insurance mm -hmm. and healthcare markets. Uh, so they were clearly turning the page. And I think more and more conservative health policy analysts have turned the page. I think the policymakers haven't quite caught up to that, but they will. The Affordable Care Act, I think, is the right structure. Uh, it's complicated, befitting the complicated healthcare system and health insurance system that we have at this point in this country. But it's increased the number of Americans with health insurance by 20 million or more. That's a tremendous accomplishment. Um, but the fixes people have in mind vary a lot. Some people want more choice for themselves, but the nature of insurance is that to give me more choice may mean giving you less choice. It would give me a chance to opt out of paying for a condition I know I don't have. And if you have that condition, you're suddenly finding it's costing you more to be insured. So there's no easy way out of the, to give everybody more choice in a sense. Um, we could lower deductibles, and we could lower premiums through more government subsidies. Uh, that raises worrying budgetary issues. Maybe good in some cases. Uh, I think we should enroll more people uh, through broader Medicaid expansions. Uh, we should make sure we have good risk adjustment reinsurance systems in place. We should uh, actively encourage people to sign up for the insurance exchanges. I view those as sort of small uh, refinements on current law or current, or current practice. But mostly we need to move on. We need to recognize that healthcare spending per patient has risen at about the same rate in private health insurance plans and government plans over the last several decades. Uh, government plans actually a little less than in private plans by estimates of people like the Congressional Budget Office. But mostly, wherever, because we're all going to some of the same doctors and hospitals and so on, costs are rising for everybody. It's a system-wide problem. That's why Stewart's pointing to the value of having everybody in a healthcare system, not distinguished by the payer or what kind of provider, but everybody in Massachusetts, say, can be so powerful because the problems are common ones across elements of the system much more than they're idiosyncratic. Healthcare spending, as much as we all, all four panelists agree, we still have a huge healthcare spending problem. Mm -hmm. But it is growing more, more slowly than it had been before at certain times in our history. How much of that is because of the ACA? Well, uh, I don't know, and I don't think we know as a profession. Um, the Affordable Care Act put in place 
uh, in Medicare, for example, a number of policies and then and a mechanism for experimenting and then applying the, the successful experiments uh, that um, I think is slowing the growth of healthcare spending in the country. Um, but it's also true if you look back over the last several decades, the rate of growth of healthcare spending has risen and fallen at different times for a variety of reasons. So you wouldn't want to point to any particular timing and say, therefore, that one thing we know happened is the cause. When CBO went back and looked uh, at healthcare, sp at Medicare spending, we saw a pronounced slowdown uh, bef starting before the Affordable Care Act was passed. So I think there are different kinds of factors at work. Um, I want to come to Stuart in a second to talk about this, some of the things that states are doing. But first, Kate, build on what Doug was talking about. If we do have the ACA, which as John Boehner famously said in 2012, you know, slow motion ending his career, it's the law of the land. Um, you know, it has been the law of the land since for, for nearly a decade now. What are the opportunities? What are the missed opportunities? What could we do to build on this system to make, uh, to use it as a cost value vehicle while also in, in continuing to, well, we build coverage up, it has slipped, but it hasn't plummeted. It's, it, it has not imploded, although we keep hearing it's about to. Um, those of you who have heard me speak before, I call it muddling through. And we're, we are in a muddling through stage. How do you get it less muddled and more what it's supposed to do? Well, if you think of the goals of health system reform as twofold, first to increase coverage and access to health care, and second to slow health care spending growth or improve the value we get out of the system, in some ways we've made much bigger strides towards the first goal than the second, I think. The millions of people who are insured either because of Medicaid expansions or on the exchanges are much, much better off than they were when they were uninsured. They have better access to care. They have care of higher quality on multiple but not all dimensions. Their health improves. So it's much better to be insured than to be uninsured. But it's expensive. When people get insured, they use a lot more health care. And that is part of the goal of expanding insurance is to increase access to needed care. We need to have a real discussion about balancing the benefits to beneficiaries against the cost to taxpayers and expanding insurance on its own is not going to slow health care spending. It's going to increase the number of people using services. And as Doug points out, that's a system level cost burden. Whenever anybody is insured, that person uses more services in a system that has a lot of common features across Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurance, health insurance exchanges. So there have, I think, been missed opportunities to slow healthcare spending. Patient payment levers are really important. We need patient cost sharing to line up with value. But I think even more powerful are the levers on the payer side of the equation. The way we buy healthcare very much drives the healthcare that we use and what we invest in new technologies, in expensive treatments versus higher value, low intensity treatments. So thinking about novel payment systems like bundled payments, capitated systems, pay for outcomes rather than pay for volume, we've dabbled in that through commercial insurance, through Medicare, through the ACA, but I don't think that we've taken the serious experimentation needed to really understand which of those levers is going to work, and our current system clearly doesn't line up resources with value. So this debate that the economists are constantly having, which is how much is prices and how much is delivery incentives systemic, and that pendulum swings, I think it's swung a lot back toward prices recently. You're saying we still have to, don't lose, fact, don't lose track of the fact that we still have a huge value problem and we're not delivering things very well. And we, this, this course we're on of through CMMI and other innovations, we need to try harder, do it more aggressively, and stick with it? Well, like a typical Weasley two-handed economist, I'm unwilling to say that it is all prices or all quantities. It's surely not Weasley, some of those. Right. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so I, I think the, um, the perception that it's all prices to me is somewhat misleading because it's very hard to compare apples to apples when we're not very good at measuring quality or intensity. Saying, you know, as, as um, Doug Elmendorf laid out in the beginning, saying one night in the hospital here equals one night in the hospital there, and really it can't be about the number of nights in the hospital because those look pretty similar in different systems. 
I don't I think that that's unduly simplistic because a night in the hospital can mean very different things in a system that delivers much more intensive care than a system that delivers less intensive care and comparing the price of one hospital night in those two systems is going to make it look like it's all prices when really it's a combination of prices and intensity or quality. So we need better measures to be able to do that disentanglement in a more sophisticated way. But fundamentally, I feel uh, that there's a lot of evidence that it is both prices and quantities and that lining up prices with value would have a beneficial effect on the quantity side as well. Stuart, um, in addition to being an academic, you <laughs> working on the uh, Massachusetts Cost Containment Program Commission. Um, Massachusetts did its universal coverage law before the country, and you really sort of did it in two stages. Politically in D.C., they had to do, partly because of the CBO, they had to do cost and coverage, or at least attempt to do cost and coverage. Massachusetts did a little more sequentially, where you, you, you made the coverage push and then you followed up with a cost push. I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but for the purpose of this conversation, talk about what has worked in Massachusetts and what other states either are doing, without going through all 50 for we don't have that much time, but some of the things that states are beginning to try that have promise, or some of the really obvious things that, um, no matter whether it's a red or a blue state, they should be thinking about. So first of all, let me re-emphasize what you just said. Since I've been doing this since the early 1970s, a lot of the experts said we, we, need, to, we need to focus on both costs and access at the same time. Economically, it makes sense. Theoretically, it made sense. Politically, it was the worst thing you could possibly do. And one of the things the Affordable Care Act learned, which they learned from Massachusetts and they learned from what happened the Clinton administration, you try to control costs and control access at the same time. And everybody, every all the major actors in the plan says there must be a better way because you begin to attack the healthcare system. So the idea that what Massachusetts did, which is exactly the same thing the Affordable Care Act did, it said we'll deal with access first, play around the edges on costs, and then we'll deal with costs second. What separates Massachusetts from the rest of the country, they actually honored that and went to focus on costs after passing the law in 2007. So let me go back to Doug's comment, which I, is very important. We deal with one system. We have different spigots of money that flow, government, private, Medicaid, out of pocket, but the reality is we have one delivery system. Happening. I wish you would show this slide. Government is protecting its spending by really reeling down hard on what it's paying for care. The fact that it's been going up the same as commercial is totally because we have more people being covered under Medicare and we have more being covered on Medicaid. If you look at the prices that Medicare is now paying for hospital care, or for physician care. It's being almost no growth at all. Where we used to be able to have Medicare on average pay in hospitals their costs, now they're paying negative 12%. On physicians, the same thing. So what Massachusetts said and is doing, and I think every country need, and every state needs to do the same thing. They're saying, we're gonna focus on total spending. We're not just going to focus on our Medicaid program. The federal government has only been focusing on Medicare. I chaired PROPAC for 12 years. MedPAC has done the same thing. CBO has done the same thing. They focus primarily on what government is spending. You can't keep doing that anymore. We have one system out there. So when Massachusetts is doing, is saying we're concerned about total spending. And remember, when you deal with prices, it's one thing to focus on a specific item. The biggest price is your insurance. Insurance premiums on the private side have been going up much faster. Why? Because we're shifting huge amounts of spending from the government side to the private side. So what we're doing in Massachusetts and now the states are beginning to do it is to say we can look at total spending. So Massachusetts has a benchmark which says we don't want spending in the state to grow by more than our state income, which is about now 3.1% growth. So we, uh, other states, uh, Delaware, Connecticut, New Mexico, 
Oregon, California, are, and more and more states are coming to us and said, what are you doing? And we're, we're working to establish mechanisms, non semi-regulatory, they're not regulatory, they're not controlling individual prices. They're focusing on the flow of dollars. Yes, they're trying to make the system higher quality and better, uh, more efficient, but the essence of it is how do you slow the amount of money total? If all you do is focus on government, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid, what you're seeing, it's popping up on the private side. So these other states, recognizing that the federal government is not focusing on anything useful. I, Doug is absolutely right. They've wasted 10 years focusing on the wrong thing. So states are beginning to act to try to slow the growth and make their system more efficient. And I'm not saying that it's better to have states do it, but if the only option is for the states to do it, they're going to. Doug, how about um, you talked about you know you believe in market forces, but we're at a point you know, it, we're not in a it's, we're not in a textbook. We're in a complicated real world. So, what do you when you say market forces aren't enough? You're not someone who wants to micromanage every single price of everything. You know, this is what a two stitches for this costs, and this is what three for that costs. Where's your, where's your intervention? Where's your version of acceptable price setting? Well, that's a good question and a hard one, and I don't have a simple answer to it. Uh, I am watching from afar uh, what Stuart and others are doing uh, in various states, uh, and I don't, I'm not an expert at that work, and I'm, but I'm hopeful that we will glean out of that work in Massachusetts and elsewhere uh, some models for what other states can do. I think, it's, I think it is natural in some ways to be at the state level. It's not just paralysis at the federal level. It is also that there are very different healthcare systems in different parts of the country. And you actually don't want um, uh, to apply some simple set of rules everywhere. What will work in Massachusetts will probably be quite different from what would work in Minnesota uh, or other states. Um, I do think that you need to impose some discipline. Right? The, the starting point for this is, uh, is the point that other countries do a variety of things in their healthcare systems, uh, but they all have some mechanism for limiting total spending. Um, or you, because without that mechanism, you end up where we are, which is spending a tremendous amount and not getting much mileage. Um, I think one thing that the government can usefully do is to use the uh, size of the market uh, in which it is involved. So Medicare is a very large payer for physician services. And the prices that Medicare sets for what it will pay physicians uh, and other providers uh, affect uh, not just the spending for that part of the system. They, I think they also can affect spending elsewhere uh, in the system. Um, so I'm not a proponent of Medicare for all, but would I let more people uh, closer to Medicare age buy into Medicare? I would. And I think that is not just giving them access, although that's an important thing. It is also moving a little more of the payments for providers to Medicare rates from uh, private sector rates. Which is why the industry doesn't like it. But that's the perfect, li before we go to audience questions, that's the perfect, tran perfect transition to Medicare for all. Bob, what does the public think about it? You got a line about what? They think about a lot of things. Medicare for all. Uh, uh, so if you just say Medicare for all, what do they think it means and do they like it? Before you get into the so not so small a, print. A, a quick License, lessons from talking to people for 20 years. Uh, Americans go through two stages. The first stage is, is whether or not they believe in a principle. You're talking about something and they think it's the right thing to do. The second stage is you have a proposal that actually affects their life, their taxes, their doctors, their insurance, and then they make a second stage decision. At the moment, particularly if you're a Democrat, as a principle, the idea of moving in this direction is popular. That's why Doug and I may slightly disagree. I don't believe the civil war with ACA is over. I think the other side has just started another, uh, another battle until the election. But what happens, and that's why in the polling communities there's a lot of cynicism about this issue, is that before, when plans introduced taxes or limiting choices, uh, support fell like a stone. And so, in, in, in my world, you're through this, of course. We want free college for everybody. I can show you poll after poll. We want free college. Uh, 
It I just have an 18 year old. Yes, <laughs> and you will want it too. And if you just remove the line about and how much taxes you would pay so everybody could go to college, uh, it goes. So, but at the moment, it's very important. People make a principle, particularly in this election, there's a lot of anger. People want to say, I believe that's where America should go. The bulk of Democrats want something more than the ACA. So that's why they're not going to make the peace until this election's over. But then there'll really be a debate about what it means for me. At the moment, they're skeptical it's really going to save a lot of health care costs. But the second phase debate uh, uh, will occur. So it's very important when you see this, just those of you, uh, none of us were, I believe, there. Uh, Harry Truman's plan had 62 percent support when he first introduced it. Half the nation had no insurance. He had Medicare for all. By the time it was over, there was a small club that came to say goodbye to Harry Truman's plan. Uh, so these battles change over time. You have to be very careful early on in making a decision. But at the moment on the Democratic side, this is a principle that's important. That's why they're not going to solve the ACA problem in the next year. They're really not going to sit around the table and fix the uh, exchanges. They have a dream about something else. I think Doug was saying he wished they would, not yes. that he expects okay, them to. Right? They, but it doesn't mean they won't get there, but this year is the dream. Uh, we'll have to see after the election. Well, I think one thing it's important to distinguish in the Medicare for All conversation is there's the Medicare buy-ins kind of schemes that, that Doug was talking about, and I'm going to ask the other two panelists about in a minute, and that's buying into current Medicare or some minor variation of a, turning Medicare into a public option, but it's Medicare as we know it. The Medicare for all legislation that's currently pending in the House, it's not, Medi it's not actually Medicare the way Medicare today exists. It's a whole new health care system for absolutely everybody in the country that gets rid of current Medicare. Gets I mean, we have a, we've heard a lot about getting rid of private insurance, but it, it, is, it is not the same. It, it would resemble, but it is not the same as today's Medicare. It, is, it gets rid of Medicaid. It gets rid of CHIP. I think it gets rid of the VA. Um, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I don't want to um, be wrong. Start a rumor. No, I'm not, I'm not sure. I've, I've actually been reading the actual legislation. I'm not quite finished. Um, but it is a new system to be put together in a two-year, um, over two years. Um, Kate, you're, is that, is the buy-in the way to start? Would you, would you accept, I mean, we're not going to get Medicare for all, whatever it turns out to look like in the next two or three years. Is Medicare a buy-in for a 50 or a 55 or a 60, whatever age they end up in? Is that something that you think makes economic sense? I think there are a lot of structural problems with the idea of Medicare for all that are masked by the slogan. And Bob makes the excellent point that it sounds like a great principle, especially when you don't say that it costs anything. But as soon as you start to dig beneath the surface to say, what do we mean by Medicare for all? What's the role of government setting prices and constraining the quantity of care that you can get, which services which people can mm -hmm. get? What's the role of the private sector and competition and driving innovation? As soon as you start to pull back those layers, I think there's much less agreement among the general public. And one of the challenges is that we live in a world of scarce resources. There are budget constraints. And I think that's the same reason that people would like the answer to be our healthcare spending is high solely because of prices and prices are just too high. If we could all get exactly the same amount of care that we're getting now and pay less, that sounds lovely. We would all live equally long and have more money for other things. But I think that that's not really feasible without having a serious conversation about you know, restricting who gets access to what care and Medicare for all surely involves someone deciding what list of services are folks eligible for and what list are they not. And as soon as you bring that to the surface, I think it becomes much less palatable for people. Stuart, you've lived through a number of Medicare for all debates over the years, going back to uh, the 70s. Um, if you want to do global budgeting and if you want to do some kind of sort of rules, sort of some kind of sort of framework for con controlling costs that's not a micromanagement. Is it easier to have everybody in the same system? Is it easier not to have 20 different insurance plans and three different big government plans and that much variation? Is there something? Go ahead. 
The answer is it's much simpler and it's more efficient, but what Kate said is absolutely correct. And that is it, it, the discussion about Medicare for all uh, masked what would happen. You, if you just lower the amount of money, understand something, people need to understand right now, you have the private side, private insurance and private payments paying 100% more for the same services that Medicare is paying. If all of a sudden you pulled out that private money and poofed it all down to government and government's not going to increase their amount of money they're paying, you're going to take a half a trillion dollars out of the American healthcare system. And if you think there's not going to be a cut in services as a result of that, what, what Kate is saying is absolutely correct. Everyone would say, look, if I can get everything I'm getting now and it's just going to be less, I love it. Why should you not be against it? The problem is, if all of a sudden you do that, it's going to be it's going to be chaos. But so what separates this debate from what anything I've ever seen? Medicare for all has never reached the fever pitch, and I think Bob would support this. We've always had a segment of the population, as he said, going back to Harry Truman. I think you can go back to the beginning of the 19th century, and we had a group. It is a bigger group today. No question about it. The problems are more serious. And it is true that if you have one budget, it's easier. But there are other countries like Germany and the Netherlands and Switzerland that maintain private insurance, but do it within some constraint on spending. I think you heard from Doug, you heard from Kate, and from me. You need some form of a budget. But it does not have to be all coming out of one spigot. If you go to the German system is something worth spending time on. It is a, it maintains private coverage, half paid for by employers, half by employees, but it has a budget and it allows the system to constrain the total spending, but not having to use the tax system as a way of funding the whole thing. So you can do it. It's more complicated. It's not as efficient but it's probably much closer to the American way than doing Medicare for all, which as Bob pointed out, it's not really on the horizon. But by focusing on that, you're not getting at what Doug talked about. We need to do serious structural reform of the Affordable Care Act, and we need to get at the things that Kate are talking about and I'm talking about. And if we just focus on discussing Medicare for all, we're going to do nothing. I think, I think that this point Stuart made, was that, I'm going to go to some questions here, is, is the, the conversation in Washington has really changed. I mean, Medicare for all is a serious part yes, of the conversation. Right. It's not happening tomorrow, but it has changed how we're talking about health care in Washington and presumably in state capitals. But I think there's also some confusion that we're using universal coverage, single payer, and Medicare for all as synonyms, and they're actually related but not the same. But anyway, but that's a whole nother webcast. Um, let's take a few questions. Um, this is sort of a, quickly, why are we still fighting about the ACA? And Bob, because you know what I would say, because you've taught me. Uh, is it, it about the ACA? Is it about health care? Uh, uh, so there are deep divisions uh, in this country about what the role of government should play about health, health insurance, and you have three groups. The federal government is way too involved, which the ACA is. The federal government should be much more involved, which is Medicare for all, and then people are in the middle. But we're 10 years down the line with ACA, and uh, at Harvard, it's not a success when you get a 50% grade. And that's what it is, a 50% grade. So a lot of people on one side or the other say this is not good enough. We're not going to go back, but we're not going to do it. So this debate in some form is going to continue, but it's really uh, who you want to make Stewart's decisions or if you want them to make it at all. But the people on one side or the other, so we're not going to get the ACA because people who want Medicare for all think it's an anemic answer to American health care. And the others on the other side believe President Trump's right. In 2021, if they have every seat in the House, uh, they're not quitting. So that, that the ACA is a middle compromise which just doesn't get uh, the blood pressure up. Um, I know we shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> we'd raise our health care prices, right? Or, you know, but it's probably a generic now for that. Um, somebody asked, uh, you know, is, is cost shifting just another way of saying consumers are always going to pay more out of pocket? 
Is that what it means? Is there other kinds of cost shifting? Kate, you want to? I'm glad you're bringing that up because it's really important to distinguish between cost shifting and changing fundamental resource allocation. The way we buy healthcare is so far from transparent for most people, particularly for patients in the system. I think the connection between health insurance premiums and cost sharing is really obscured to people. Usually when cost sharing goes up, premiums go down and there's a trade-off there. And part of the reason that insurers introduce more cost sharing is to change the way that people consume healthcare, to get them to buy less healthcare because they're paying more out of pocket. So the total spending goes down. Now in, in the long run for employees, all of that feeds back into their compensation. When health insurance premiums go up, their wages go down or grow less quickly. So thinking about the total package is really important and it's just not the way we buy things. Of course, that's not one for one. When your cost sharing goes up this year, you may not have the resources to be able to consume the health care that you really need. So it's not to say that we shouldn't be thinking about access to care. It's really important, but it's important to consider the whole package, not just the cost sharing, but also the premiums that are also coming out of people's pockets. What about cost sharing? I mean, some of the ideas about improving the ACA, are they shifting the cost to the taxpayer? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, we'd all rather have our own health care be inexpensive and have somebody else pay. And it might be more equitable. <laughs> that's a natural right. reaction. I think part of what you see in the country now, though, is there are a lot of Americans uh, who have not benefited very much from the overall growth of our economy over the last few decades. Um, people in the top 20 percent, certainly people in the top 1 percent, have had a terrific run uh, for the last 30, 40 years. But people in much of the income distribution have seen only very small gains in their standards of living. And when you say to them, well, the solution to our problem is we all have to sacrifice a little bit. We need a shared sacrifice. Their answer is, hey, wait a second. I've already given. <laughs> I'm not interested in sacrificing now. That's always going to be true to some extent for people. It's a natural human reaction. But I think it is particularly acute now, given the developments we've seen uh, in the overall economy over the last few decades. And I think that makes American, many Americans skeptical of government and whether the government is really helping them, right. but also skeptical of big businesses. <laughs> and so skeptical of big insurance companies, uh, skeptical of big drug makers, skeptical of maybe local hospitals. So they may think at some point it's where they go to get treated and that's good, but if that hospital is a public, essentially becoming a public utility in that area, they want it handled like other utilities are handled. And so I think we should recognize that the Medicare for All has some particular roots, but I think it partly comes out of a general frustration that our system is not serving a lot of people very well. And healthcare is one very important example of that. And it's one of the ways I think whether you get into the details and you ask people about sort of the specifics of Medicare for All and how to pay for it and some of the consequences the support goes down. But I think one reason it appeals is there's a basic, we'd all get the same thing. Right. There's a basic yes. message of fairness, yes. which gets to this sort of economic right. inequality issue right. that we have in this country that's also been one reason that Medicaid has, you know, Medicaid expansion, the people just above that level are resentful. Yeah. There's a, qu a very good question about transparency and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna throw it to Stuart, um, partly because I wanna know if how Massachusetts is cost containment, what, what the role of transparency has been. The Trump administration has floated the idea of requiring hospitals to disclose the prices they negotiate for services with health insurers. Is that a good idea? Why? And how much is this concept of consumers knowing what you're going to pay for and being able to shop? I mean, we are all sophisticated healthcare consumers and none of us can do it, right? So Stuart, is transparency going to solve things? No. Is it? So first of all, no economist could ever be against transparency and making prices available. But much of it is, this is all rhetoric and pure nonsense. If you don't face, if you don't face, if you're a consumer, if you're a consumer and you have insurance and the fact that the hospital price, as a matter of fact, you might say the higher the price, the more I want to go there because that must be better quality and somebody else is paying the bill. Transparency by itself is a nice thing, but it's useless. You need to link transparency into the fact that the cons a, they understand it, but more importantly, that they have some ability that if they 
choose the higher price institution, they're going to have to pay more. And they know there's a good quality institution someplace else. So most of this discussion about transparency, particularly the Trump plan, it's 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 not it's I don't want to say it's useless, but it's useless. <laughs> Kate, if we're going to have value, I mean, and the by the way, it's not only Trump. I hear it all the time, you know, and we even hear it in Massachusetts. What you need. Yes, you need people to understand what the prices are, but they, and they talked a little bit, they have to have some ability to sort of face the difference. And we are seeing that with these limited or tiered networks, we are beginning to see more and more people facing the idea that if they go to a more expensive institution for the same service, they're going to wind up having to pay more. That is having an impact on where people go. So here in Massachusetts, if a woman has a baby in a local community hospital, it costs one thing. It could cost 50% more if they go to a big downtown big teaching hospitals. And it is having an effect on where people have that. Same thing, not obviously they're going to go to the more expensive ones for expensive care. So transparency is good, but it needs to be built into something more. It can't just sit there by itself. Which is a good question for Kate, because if you're talking about value, which is implicitly also talking about quality, what, what, what transparency piece do you need for the consumer to, to help the patient understand? I mean, what is the, what is the co transparency component in value? We we're losing her, her sound. We lost okay. you. How's that? Very good. <laughs> Welcome um, back. All right. We call that user error. Um, <laughs> the, uh, of, of course, patients have to know what costs they face. There's no way to make a good decision if patients don't know the prices that they need to pay. And those prices have to be lined up with where the care is actually worth getting. So there are a couple of challenges there. First, it has to come from a reliable source. When insurers put providers in different tiers, for example, and say that it's because of quality or value, patients may question, does the insurer want me to go to the best place or does the insurer want me to go to the cheapest place? And that's the point that Stuart was making, that sometimes people take a signal of quality from the price that they're paying. But second, I also think we need patients to go to the high intensity, you know, fancier hospitals for conditions where there's a health difference when they go there versus conditions where there isn't. That's most evident for more commoditized services like x-rays, where if there's a reference price, if the insurer says, we'll pay this much for an x-ray, which will get it done at a place that meets these quality standards, any place else you want to go that costs more, you have to pay the difference. That's a, a potentially very powerful tool to steering patients to the places where their dollars are going the furthest. And having patients share in the savings when they go to lower cost but high quality sites of care seems really important. That's also the principle in narrow networks, as uh, Stuart was alluding to, that providers can uh, compete to be included in insurers' networks by offering high enough quality services at low enough prices. And that's a way for them to get more patients and a way for insurers to negotiate lower prices for the same services at the same providers. And all of that works when those prices are evident to patients when they're making their decisions about which insurers to choose and then which providers to choose. So we're nearly out of time. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give a takeaway or a, a take home message on this. And I'm going to end with Bob about what does the patient, consumer, public, voter, whatever we're going to call him or her, think about it. Stuart, the takeaway message, what is, what's the one thing people should hear so from let this? Me, let me go back to what you asked in the book. One of the things that we've learned in Massachusetts, even though we don't have a hard and fixed budget, by, imp by sending out a clear message that we don't want overall spending to grow by more than our growth, in our state income and holding every provider and every payer in, in principle. It's not that we regulate them, but if they exceed those rates, we make it, we put it out in the newspaper, we call them in, we talk to them, and in fact, they are listening. We need more of that. We need to create, if not a real budget, 
quasi or budget that says we have limits and then within that to try to find redo the delivery system to provide higher quality and to get rid of services that really don't add that much. But if you don't have that budget or quasi budget, what you do is swishing money around. So we need to do that. And we're trying to do that in Massachusetts in a non-regulatory way. And, and, if, and I'd like to see the federal government begin to do more of that itself. So it's budget, value, and public shaming. That seems to be the approach. Kate. If you're not gonna re I don't want to be a regulator anymore. I did that when I was 25. I'm not doing that. I, at my you're still 25 now, <laughs> at heart. OK, Kate. Uh, so I think my takeaway is that prices matter, but quantities matter too. And we don't live in a fictional world of unlimited resources, as lovely as that would be. So we need to have a serious conversation about who's making the decision about resource allocation and set up a system of pricing that's consistent with healthcare dollars being devoted to the places where they're improving health the most and where there's access across the income distribution that we find acceptable as a society. Okay. Doug. My takeaway is that this is a big problem of healthcare spending in this country. And ultimately, we will need to make significant changes. But we should not wait for some single big bang perfect solution. This will be an incremental effort. And when the people you polled, Bob, said they don't think this will really do it or that will really do it, well, nothing will do it alone, nothing that we would find acceptable as a society. So we need that. But the lesson of that is not to do none of those things. It is to do a lot of those things. That's where I'll leave it. And Bob, where's uh, the public? Uh, so uh, one contribution here, uh, lowering the rate of spending uh, has incredibly little impact on public thinking. And so just two points is uh, we cut taxes. Nobody believes their employer gave it to them in wages. I'm sorry. Uh, 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 we have had periods of high profits in companies. Turns out people don't believe the employer gives it uh, to them. So slowing the rate from 4% to 3% alone. What people who really want to have to look for wins, it's things that are very visible, that this is actually cheaper for you as a human being. Now, it doesn't mean you're not interested in the aggregate. We have no wins in this. This aggregate number doesn't have an impact, and people don't believe they get it back. So you have to do this. It was in like the 2008 economic calendar, downturn. You have to show, Mr. President, some of these places don't close. You have an aggregate. Some of these places didn't close. They didn't lay off 10,000. We need some wins here where average people say they actually contain this thing. And I trust you to do the, do the rest. But we haven't had big wins where individuals see this happen. It's also none of us will ever be unemployed. Uh, that's the beauty of American health care. OK, thank you all for joining us at this, at this conversation today. The next forum is called Battling Natural Disasters, a governor's roundtable. I guess health care was sort of the unnatural disaster. Yes. Uh, that, <laughs> that is on you April. You said it, they didn't. That is April. But that is, I, maybe I'm not going to be invited back now. <laughs> April 16th, 2019 at noon, forum hsph.org. That's the next one. We will be back with more conversations about public health and the cost in the future. So uh, hope this was useful for everybody. Thank you for having me.